Nicholas, thank you very much for joining us from Belgium. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. I've been listening to the podcast for quite a while, so uh, it's uh, an honor actually to be on the podcast myself as well. Uh, the honor is all ours, and and uh, yeah, it's so great to have guests that um, that do listen to the podcast. And I know uh, when we first spoke, you there were a few that you'd uh, you'd flagged as having li- listened to, and I think you're actually the second CTA from Belgium that we've had on the podcast. So. Uh, I don't know. Do you know how many CTAs there are in Belgium? Because we're making a good dent into that market. Yeah, since uh, last week, we we're up to five now. Oh, wow. So we, okay. We we had at the end of last year, we had uh, Lilith, who uh, was number four, and then Robin, who was, uh, yeah, since last week, number five. Oh, uh, of course, Lilith. I'm I'm speaking to her soon as well. So that, that's, uh, that's good okay. to know that. So I'm definitely making my way uh, in through the, the numbers of the CTAs in, in Belgium. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but look, we've got a lot to discuss, and obviously, we'll go through your career and and how you became a CTA, and obviously, that's going to be part of the topic. But I like to kind of look backwards and and understand how you got to the point you're at now, and I guess where your interests came from, and um, and I guess what led you to the career of of being a Salesforce architect. So, when did you um, when did you first become interested in I guess computers, but then um, studying software engineering? When when did that become something that that you you wanted to pursue? Yeah, well, I, I love to tell this story because uh, it was it started when I was a little kid. We had the, this computer. It was a Windows computer from my dad's work, actually. Uh, and then, you know, uh, back then, they had encyclopedias on CD-ROM that I was using to do my homework and stuff like that. I was, I was quite fascinated by that. Uh, and up to the point that, uh, I don't know how it was in Australia, but in Belgium, we had these friend books where you could give it to other people and they could fill out their interests and all that stuff. Uh, and I always uh, said when they asked, okay, what do you want to be later? Uh, I always say I want to be an IT guy because I was so interested in the, in computers. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, later on that, uh, yeah, that there was, that feeling was prolonged uh, by being interested in video games. I, really love to play video games and I think at some point I wanted to be a video game developer or you know create my own video game something of the sorts uh, I never got around to that but uh, yeah the the computer stuff always uh, was in the back of my mind and so when I had to choose a direction what to study when I went to university that's when I uh, picked up software engineering but it's never too late to uh, to make your own game yeah that's true that's true and uh, so, so you you started studying software engineering, and you you did a master's, I believe, which um, in software engineering as well. Yeah. So there was actually, uh, yeah, there was the the IT um, bachelor, and then you could uh, extend that with a master in software engineering, uh, which went a bit more onto uh, specific areas like uh, video editing, and uh, even we did a little business projects which i really liked uh, where you really had to pitch it in front of uh, a client which was then our professor uh, yeah so nice. it was quite a cool experience yeah. so what when you when you um you completed your master's you were ready to go into the workforce like what was it that was what were you looking for as a, a graduate uh, as a you know a software engineer what what was it that was going to excite you about your first step into the workforce well what was most important for me was to stay close to the technology um, because yeah, that's what I studied, that's what I love. Uh, and so at first I did some um, uh, job interviews for becoming a developer, so more a developer role, uh, but those didn't pan out and I, I kept my options open. Also uh, had a friend who was working in consulting at Accenture. And so I did an interview there and I was really blown away, I would say, by the, the people. Not necessarily, well, the, the technology also played an important role, of course, but really the, the atmosphere, uh, that was really what, uh, what pulled me in. And then, of course, the opportunity that I would get to stay close to the technology, that combination that was actually perfect for me. So how, obviously coming straight out of um, university, straight into consulting and, um, and being a consultant, how did you, um, I guess, how did you fare initially? Was it uh, like a natural progression for you did you feel comfortable as a consultant and um and i guess the next part of that is when you say you wanted to stay close to the technology what did you actually do as a consultant 
Yeah, so I was actually in a, a team that was doing the actual implementations uh, quite close, either uh, do, doing it onshore uh, with the team itself in Belgium or with a couple of uh, people uh, and offshore uh, in India, for example. But I started actually in the Java space. So we did for a, a public, uh, public sector, we did the Java implementation uh, with some mobile as well. Uh, so it was quite different from the Salesforce path that I took later, uh, but that lasted for, for about six months. But I noticed immediately that I could take a role where I was technical. I was writing some Selenium scripts that ex existed back then as well uh, to automate some of the Java testing that uh, we needed to do. Uh, so that, yeah, that really excited me that I could take those opportunities and say, hey, uh, let's find a solution for a problem we're having in the project uh, with the technology uh, that exists. And how long was it before you went from working on Java projects to Salesforce? It was after that that first project, after six months. Uh, then actually, uh, you know, had somebody from Accenture who I didn't know who was calling me, hey, uh, what do you know about Salesforce? I'm like, yeah, it's in the cloud. Uh, <laughs> that's about all I knew, right? <laughs> Uh, and so he said, okay, I'll send you a video, look at it, and uh, let me know if you're interested. We have a project starting soon. So I looked at it. It seemed interesting, right? Uh, in the beginning of your career, you just take whatever chance you get, right? Every opportunity that you get. And so I went with it. And uh, yeah, that was the first project uh, where we did service clouds in, uh, in a Belgian uh, company. Uh, but it was actually a, a global company, and then we started rolling that out to different countries, the to uh, Netherlands, Germany, UK, France, uh, and yeah, we implemented it there locally, and then also trained the people uh, in in those countries. A good landing into that the Salesforce the world. Part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That took me. I think that project was one and a half, two years, yeah. and then it just continued on from there. So. Uh, by then, uh, in the beginning, I would say when I started uh, on Salesforce projects, we didn't really have a Salesforce team that didn't exist yet, at least not in Belgium. Uh, and then it uh, gradually started with more projects coming up across uh, Belgium. And then uh, by the time that the second project started, uh, we really had a team. Uh, and yeah, I could just do one Salesforce project after another. So that was... Yeah, a bit of a luxury, but also a good learning school for me. Sure. So uh, interestingly, like you were given an opportunity to work on Salesforce, like someone called you and, you know, asked you if you're interested and, and off you went and you've never looked back. But I guess a lot of um, there will be a lot of graduates joining these big global SIs and, um, you know, they, they join often in large numbers each year and it can be difficult to stand out and, and I guess, get those opportunities. So how did you make sure... And while you were working within a consulting organization that you were standing out and that, you know, you weren't being overlooked for progression and, and exciting new challenges. Well, to be honest, that's, I didn't really do anything specifically, I would say. It's also not in my nature to, uh, to, to brag about what I've done or to create visibility for myself. Um, I learned that over the course uh, of, uh, of my uh, career. But in the beginning, I would say it was just an eye for detail, um, making sure that everything that I delivered, that it was 100% correct, and I wouldn't uh, go for 99%, right? Uh, and, and checking with others around me, right? That's also a big part of being in a consultancy company. It's you're not alone, right? You mm -hmm. Use other people around you, even if it's just on the project. All right, in the beginning, it was a lot of my project manager that I was sparring with directly. But then over time, yeah, you reach out to maybe previous project members or, uh, you know, some of your uh, offshore counterparts uh, that, that uh, you learned a lot from. Uh, but really that eye for detail and being a reliable resource, that was very important because... Uh, that's also what my manager at the time and my career counselor, which is kind of coach right in the company, uh, they both picked up on that uh, and they were kind of advocates for what I was doing. And I guess I was quite lucky in that way that 
those people were already uh, knowing how to uh, make my work then in that case visible to others uh, and and that's how I grew sure. but then over time yeah, I needed to learn how to make myself a bit visible and go a bit I, I would say against my nature uh, to uh, brag a bit about what I've done it's not really bragging but showing others hey you know th this is something that I've done and I'm proud of it right yeah nice yeah I guess it, it is a natural for everyone but in consulting especially in a big consulting firm I guess it, it can become important but if you are seen as a reliable resource then also other people will be doing the the brand or the the promotion for you as well because you know they're they're putting their reputation on the line by recommending the work that you've done and, and putting your name forward for certain opportunities i guess as well yeah 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 definitely i think what also helped is that mostly the people on the the onshore teams they're more a combination of uh like admin salesforce admin with you know strong functional background understanding business processes and so on uh, while i was always pulling that technical side towards me so from the beginning you know i was diving into the code together with the developers you know i i even remember that uh, we had a, a somebody from the philippines in our development team come over on shore uh and you know we were really sparring okay how can we best implement this i know that's how you learn a lot by seeing how others are doing it but also getting your hands dirty right and i was seeing that not a lot of other people were doing that inside of the salesforce space uh, and especially as the team grew uh there were more people on the functional side that knew how to declaratively uh build an application but on the really technical architecture side that's yeah, a skill that's not a lot uh, or that, that that doesn't come very often so were you actually because obviously when you're working with an offshore team sometimes the work can be passed offshore and you're doing code reviews and you're you know doing some design and, and maybe giving guidance on how to do it but were you actually um getting to write code as well in those early days uh yes in the early days yes um but maybe it was just even some wireframes, the, the actual end deliverable usually it, it, it was lying with uh, the offshore teams. Uh, but like saying, hey, you know, this is uh, in some pseudo codes how you could write this, uh, which for me was the interesting part, right? Making sure that you know all of the syntax is correct and you know that it's uh, that, that it runs without errors. That was not really the interesting part for me. It's more, okay, how do I solve this problem? How can I translate it into Salesforce uh, on, on a technical level? That was really exciting. And that's also what I evolved more into uh, now also as an architect. But then, yeah, sometimes you don't even see uh, the code that's uh, sitting behind it. Yeah. And and that was going to be my next question. Like, when when would you have classed yourself an architect in that journey? Like, at what point were you an architect, or w whether that was by title or by responsibility? And and how did you become an architect? Like, what were the steps that you took to to be ready to be an architect? Well, for me, it's it's always being interested in the technical side, always learning more more and more about okay, not only how do you do this, but how do you do this well, right? What's the best practice? And not taking whatever you did on a previous project as, okay, this is the right way to do things, right? It's always challenging. Uh, that's kind of just the mindset that I had going in. Maybe something that I learned in, in university, thinking critically, right? Um, and over time, that just naturally evolved into an architect role. Um, but the first one, first role that I would say I really felt like an architect was when I had somebody else as a technical lead and I was doing the, the more high level architecture. Okay, how does it fit inside of a bigger picture, right? Uh, and yeah, that's, that's just being, I think it ties back to being uh, recognized for the good work that I've done in the past. Right, knowing that you're a reliable resource, you know the technology inside and out, then eventually people will say, oh, yeah, but if we put Nicola in that role, we're sure that he will do a good job. Uh, and then yeah, at some point, there is just no architect, no 
other architect around, right? Then you uh, kind of get that uh, role naturally assigned to you. Um, and I think what I needed as a kind of going in to really, found, really think of myself as an architect is just have a lot of experience in different companies. Because, okay, I th we talked about my first client where I stayed. Uh, so one and a half years was the first project and then I think another year for the second project. Um, but then afterwards, I really did a lot of clients in different industries. And for me, that helped me a lot, right? Uh, utilities, banking, insurance, you name it, right? I've, I'm, I think public sector was a bit uh, more later, a bit later, uh, but that also uh, made an appearance. Chemicals, that was really a broad range of different companies, different processes, different mindsets. Uh, different IT landscapes and that's what gives me just a lot of practice I would say in how to solve uh, the, the different kind of problems that you could have in, in an IT architecture uh, and that helped me also get some confidence in hey I can call myself an architect. And it's interesting because I guess you, you like nothing changes as you progress through your career like how you mentioned before like be a reliable resource like ask people when you don't know the answers like i guess it's the same when you're an architect as when you're a, a graduate uh, doing your first job exactly the the only difference is you build your knowledge over time by and and that's something that i really enjoy doing is continuous learning um and and the second is experience by experiencing it in different situations different organizations and that's what I really like about consulting is that you typically jump to different projects and definitely in the Salesforce space where yeah, projects are typically shorter, right? They're three months to a year, I would say on average. Uh, and yeah, that just gives you a lot of opportunities to uh, be involved with different companies. So you, you mentioned that you have a thirst for learning and, and like, bringing knowledge on and, and just continually learning um but you have spent most of your career working with salesforce um like in terms of, obviously you had the java stint at the beginning and i know you'll have worked in projects where salesforce is a part of a bigger program of work that touches on other things but how important has it been for you in your own time to continually learn things outside of the salesforce ecosystem as well and, and what kind of things have you kind of focused on yeah i think uh, when I go back to my studies there, I had a broad basis, right? We we learned everything from uh, VBA to, you know, deep assembly into C, C++, uh, all, all that kind of things, all those kind of things. So I, I had a good basis to understand, okay, what is out there? Um, and that really helped me. But for me, once I started working, uh, it's just some some things that i pick up it could be inside of the job that things that i pick up like okay i want to understand uh, more how javascript is working uh, especially when uh, lwc uh, was launched and lightning web components where everything is in javascript but even before that i was doing some things in node.js uh, those are just things that popped up because i saw somebody else you know in a salesforce related blog post talking about that and I said, okay, that's interesting. Um, now uh, I saw somebody talking about, okay, how can you build your own personal website? Okay, and they did that with, uh, with Go. Uh, so then I started to learn a bit, okay, how is this uh, Go thing working? Uh, and it's more accidental, I would say, uh, accidentally that I come into contact with these technologies. Uh, and if it piques an interest, then, I, I love to dig deep, right? I think that's one part. Uh, and then other parts are just things that I encounter inside of the job. Because like you say, okay, you have Salesforce, but then you you always talk, for example, about, okay, how can we get the data inside of Salesforce? So you need to work with tools like uh, ETL tools. Uh, I you know, in, in one of the projects, uh, we had cost iron. It's, a, it's an IBM product uh, that we were using. So, okay, I just 
to look together with the developer. Okay, how is this working, right? Because it's also part of our scope. Maybe I can help out with that as well. Um, now, okay, we have uh, we have MuleSoft inside of the Salesforce uh, space, which is interesting to me. Um, but then, you know, even lower down, okay, before it goes into an ETL tool, you have to have an SQL database, right? Uh, so learning about, okay, I already knew some SQL from, from back in university, but okay, how can we best apply that? Um, and then sometimes you get lucky. Uh, I also got lucky with one of the projects where it was not only a Salesforce implementation, but we it was tied to Heroku, right? And on Heroku, you have different types of languages that you can interact with. And there we actually uh, wrote a Python application uh, that was kind of doing the number crunching outside of Salesforce and then pushing it back. And there was Python, but also uh, doing deep database optimization to make sure that all of the queries that were running were very performant. And so then I learned a lot about new technologies on the job. Um, but it's really, if I see something, it piques my interest. You know, I bite into it and try to find out as much as I can about it. Um, and maybe a last example there is now inside of uh, Salesforce, yeah, we're a product company, right? Uh, we built the product. So looking at the engineering side of things, where there are very, very smart people, I'm really amazed, uh, that are working every day uh, on our products. And looking at some of the topics that, that they're discussing amongst themselves is just so interesting to me. Uh, the, and I learn a lot about technologies that I would never come in contact with in my day to day. Uh, but still, you know, it, it's that that piques my interest, and I want to know more about it. That's uh, kind of the red thread throughout it all. Yeah, I mean, it must be a, like a playground for a technologist working in Salesforce with the amount of smart people and the amount of um, collaboration, I guess, across the world that, that would go on. And, and you know, and it is a, glo a truly global company where you would get to, to talk to people in India and then San Francisco and, you know, across Europe. And, and yeah, I can only imagine if you're if you have a thirst for learning, it would be a great place to, to keep learning. Definitely. So you stayed with um, one consulting company for quite a, a considerable period of time. And I, I guess I say a considerable, per, a considerable period of time in these days. Um, I know historically people would stay at companies for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, but you did stay, at, and that's not common in the Salesforce ecosystem. People kind of jump around quite often. So how, how did you benefit from staying in one organization and growing with one company rather than you know, choosing, because a lot of people go between one partner to another partner to another partner. And um, I always wondered, like, what's different about those roles? You know, like, why are you going from one to another? What, what aren't you getting in the one that you're in? So what, what was it that kept you in one and, and what kept you learning and, and growing? What kept me personally in one is, for me, building new relationships, it's, it's not easy, right? It, sometimes it might seem like it's easy to me, but uh, it, it really takes a lot of energy for me. Uh, and so when I've built already a lot of relationships inside of the company, that's not something that I want to give up easily. Um, I think that's one part. The second part is also um, at some point, you really become committed. You believe in, in what that company is doing and you're committed to you know, a, a bigger cause than yourself, uh, right? What what the, the company is uh, striving towards. And that's something that I always kept on believing in. Um, and then the third part is I had to, a good, I think it's a good advice from somebody who said, yeah, why would you change companies if there are still opportunities for you to learn inside of the company that you're with? Yeah. Right. And I always had that feeling uh, up until when I changed to uh, to Salesforce. I always had that feeling. Yes, there is still more to learn here for me, um, and and I feel like I can uh, really grow personally, professionally uh, inside this company. Um, and then maybe to address uh, the other part where you say, okay, a lot of people are jumping around. I think you can jump around, and jumping around is usually good for your salary for your title that you get um but personally i don't believe that it has a positive impact on 
uh, the experience that you gain over time. Um, why do I say that? Because whenever you join a company, you first need to, you know, get the basics right. Uh, it's stupid things like uh, learning to work with Google versus Teams, right? Or it could be uh, understanding how your time tracking works or whatever, right? You need to invest a lot of time on onboarding. Then understanding the methodologies that that company is using and so on. Uh, but then by the time you actually, you know, can really learn and, and get more out of it. Uh, yeah, then you've spent already quite some time. Uh, and that's also a benefit from my point of view in staying with one company. You already have that basis and you can just keep on building uh, your your knowledge throughout that, uh, that time with one company. Yeah, I think the point about like learning is like when, when someone comes to me and they're looking for a new role, the, the, the one, if it's not because they they feel they're underpaid, the, the major thing is because they feel that they've stopped learning. Um, and I guess like in consulting, you're, you're, it's obviously, yeah, it's important that you're working for a company that you, you buy into, like you said, but it's also important that the company that you're working for can provide the, the kind of projects that are going to give you that platform to learn. And it sounds like you, you know, the projects you've mentioned uh, were big, chunky projects where you were working, you know, on, on European rollouts and things like that. So I guess that also plays a, a part, right? If you, if every new project is a new industry and, and a new challenge, then then that kind of ticks the boxes as well. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And and I won't uh, deny that I might have been lucky in in that uh, aspect. Um, yeah, as I said, I think it's also being known for uh, being a good uh, person, a good resource, that, that helps as well, right? Uh, and then over time, yeah, when there are these uh, new projects where they need some deep technical expertise, it doesn't matter which, which industry, they will ask you. And then mm -hmm. after a while, I could even say, hey, maybe I don't want to do this project because it's very similar to something that I did before. Or sometimes, you know, I, I said, hey, maybe this client, I've seen that client now, let me change with another client, even if there is not an immediate role available, right? It's funny, isn't it? Because that, that point about um, having having worked with, like I've done that project before with another client, so I don't want to do it again, because you would think the manager would be like, well, then you're the perfect person to do it again, because you've already done it once before. Like I can, I have no stress here. I can put you on this project and you'll do it easily. That's also true. And sometimes you have to yeah, bite the bullet or however you say that, right? And you do something that you know, okay, maybe it's not the most interesting role, but it will help out the company. And that's a give and take. Uh, and that's something that, that I learned throughout my career as well. Uh, you cannot just from the start get any project that you want. Uh, so in the beginning, I was always a bit, okay, just whatever project you throw at me, I'll take it. Uh, and then after a while, okay, maybe it's a project that doesn't interest me. I speak up about it. I say, okay, it's not the most interesting project, but, you know, I'm happy to do it for two or three months to help you out, to find somebody else that can take over. And and that really worked well. But first, yeah, you have to have that, that credibility in the company. Uh, and that also helps if you're, of course, longer with uh, with the company once you've built those relationships. Yeah, I, you have to earn the right. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, when did becoming a CTA? When was that? Uh, when did that become a goal of yours? And and um, can you kind of shed some light on how that journey played out for you? Sure. Um, it actually, I never made it a goal for myself. I would say. Um, what do I mean with that? Is I, yeah, as I said, I have this thirst for learning so those new uh, prerequisites uh, designer credentials they came out at some point uh, so I started working on them just because I was interested in those parts of the system I wanted to learn more about it not necessarily because I wanted to go for that CTA title uh, in my head it was okay it's something for people who have like 15 20 years of experience uh, okay I'll see it when I get there right um, but then once I got the prerequisite uh, certifications, uh, I was suddenly invited to, um, to the, the CTA program that we had at Accenture. Uh, and there they say, yeah, okay, uh, hey, do you want to join this program? This is how we're doing it. Um, and, but if you join, then 
you need to set a target for yourself by when you want to get it. And it sounded interesting. I set the targets, I don't know, it was one and a half years or two years. It shifted a couple of times as well, right? Depending on project priorities, you you shift that kind of thing. Um, but it was something that I was continuously doing. Uh, I had a, a mentor assigned, which was actually uh, Tamim, Tamim Barry, who oh, yeah. literally wrote the book on CTA, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I worked with him every couple of weeks. We had uh, a mock uh, and just walking through that, but not really with uh, a fixed deadline, right? I had in my mind, okay, maybe in one and a half, two years, but let's see where it takes us. Uh, and I was kind of going off of his feedback to see, okay, is this something that I can take on? Yes or no. Right. Um, and then at some point, yeah, we both had the feeling, okay, might be time to try it. Um, and then I scheduled it, I think in 2018, at the end of 2018, scheduled the first uh, one was in London. Uh, and that one, I had a, a section retake. On the on development life cycle, uh, then waited for uh, quite a while to get a date, okay? Because I was okay. I'm I'm in that flow, right? I I'm prepared for the exam. Let me retake this one section. Um, but then, yeah, I think there was some uh, uh, some issue with the scheduling and so on. In the end. I, know, I think it was somewhere in March of 2019 or April where I got the, the message saying, hey, uh, you can take your retake, but uh, it was Friday and it was the next Monday. No way. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was yeah, really doubting because okay, I had no time to prepare just the one weekend. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah, I didn't want to wait yeah, more than four months for another date. Uh, so I said, okay, let's just go for it. Uh, and But yeah, that was clearly a mistake. I wouldn't recommend anyone doing that. Uh, so I failed that uh, section retake then on that Monday. Um, but I, I got good feedback from both, um, uh, from, from both uh, my mentor and then uh, also from the Salesforce team and from Suzanne. Uh, they were saying, yeah. We know you can do it. You just had a bad day. Yeah. Uh, so then, and and they were quite forthcoming in scheduling another board then in July of 2019. Uh, and then I really prepared. And meanwhile, uh, Tamim had, had left the company. So I was actually preparing with Andrew, Andrew Hart. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we, uh, we got there in the end uh, in July of 2019 uh, in Berlin. So that, that was uh, yeah, quite a, a glorious moment, I would say. Yeah, I can imagine. So, so the area that you um, obviously you got the partial pass, the area that that you needed to reset. Did you know that that was going to be the area that would you would find most challenging? Not at all. Really? That, that's and and that's also something that I heard a lot uh, during the preparation. Is okay, you know, development life cycle. Uh, it's. Uh, you, pre you can prepare it fully upfront. It doesn't matter what the scenario is. Uh, you know, you, you draw your environment diagram, you explain how you will do uh, your Git branching, how you, ex how you combine it, Git with the different types of testing that you can do. And, you know, that's it. You can bring almost the same story every time and you need to tweak it a little towards what the exact scenario is, uh, but that's it. Um, but what I really struggled on during the, the exam was more around the governance setup. So, okay, how do you work with the center of excellence? How do you make sure that all of your stakeholders are in alignment? Uh, how do you tackle uh, on you know, a higher level those different aspects, uh, the, the security, the data, and so on? And uh, I knew that from... I had done it in my projects, right? I had done it. I've at some point I was also a project manager, so I wasn't the, involved in all of those discussions. But I really had trouble putting it to words, especially not being prepared putting it into the right words. Um, and and that's why I think yeah it was uh, the right call of the judges to uh, to not pass me at that time. 
Um, but yeah, then uh, I, I think in the last exam, I kind of overdid it <laughs> by uh, focusing too much time on the development life cycle. Because uh, that was actually one of the feedback that I got, <laughs> that I got that uh, said, yeah, okay, you could have focused a bit less on that area. Um, but actually, yeah, the, the area that I was most uh, struggling with uh, was the identity and access management. Um, because also because Tamim was really grilling me on that, right? Really trying to figure out, okay, where, where are the holes in my knowledge? Um, and at some point, I just decided, okay, I have to do this myself. I need to get my hands dirty. Uh, and that's why I also, when I also built that uh, Node.js app, uh, where I really built a, an app that was connecting to Salesforce and trying out all of the different identity flows, you know, trying to figure out even going into the, the official RFC documents, uh, which are uh, generated by, by the W3C, uh, where it was really described, okay, how should this protocol work, the standard of this protocol work, not necessarily related to Salesforce, but to all of security. Uh, diving into that, and that really helped me uh, understand that through and through. Uh, together then uh, with um, uh, with Lawrence Newcomb, uh, who was uh, sparring with me on this topic uh, back and forth, uh, uh, he had some uh, uh, some flows drawn out in the Lucid chart, uh, and we were discussing, okay, is this part right, is this part right? And that's how I really got a very, very deep understanding of that area, maybe too deep, but it's a bit the same as the other things, right? I find something that grasps my interest and I bite into it and I don't let go. Uh, and that's still up until this day, that's something that's uh, an area of interest for me. Whereas, you know, going into the CTA exam, it was some of the, it was the area that I was worrying most about. And did, did you ever, I guess you, you said that the Salesforce get and your mentor and Suzanne, they gave you good feedback. Like how hard was that motivation to go again for the third, um, that, that retake the, the, the second time? The, so the, the section retake, yeah, that, yeah, I was waiting for that. So that was not hard at all. Uh, and I also was very close, right? It's just one section. Uh, the second time, or the the, sec the second full review board, I would say, I was still motivated. I I also knew myself that I could do it, right? And when others confirm that feeling, then yeah, then I I didn't really have any doubts. Maybe it was just a bit more practice. Uh, being a bit more comfortable, more confident, uh, retrying, okay, how will I do this presentation? And it's really building up that confidence as well. Uh, but yeah, I was really determined uh, to, to get there. So yeah, I was fully motivated. If I had failed that, the, the, yeah, the last one that I did, I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. But uh, yeah, I was definitely still very motivated uh, for the second full one so just to clarify i didn't know that that was a, a fact like i thought you so you you did the first one got a partial pass did the the module reset but then if you don't pass that one you have to do a full review board again yes back back when i uh, was doing it yes that was the rule now the rule has changed so now you can have uh either uh, so if you fail two sections, you can do a retake of those two sections. Right. If you fail a single section, you can have two retakes of the single section. So they made it, uh, it I mean, it was the, the, the concept of having to do it all again must have been, uh, although you were motivated, it must have like, yeah, it must have been pretty uh, intense. Yes. It, well, yes and no. Because if you do a single section retake, the knowledge that you need to have on that topic also needs to be a lot deeper, right? right. And you get a lot of a lot deeper questions, even if the time is more limited. Um, so yeah, it has its pros and cons, I would say. 
so because you you never went into it like with the goal of be like initially it was right i'm going to do the the um prerequisites i'm going to tick those off like where did the motivation come from throughout the process like did it then all of a sudden become this thing that you were like i just i need to achieve this like or was it like because it's such a big challenge right and it takes so much time that that i speak to so many people that have this goal of being a cta and even people that are like really early on in their Salesforce journey and they have this goal and they're like really striving hard and putting in the hours and the effort to get there. But for you, it wasn't necessarily like, I really want to be a CTA. It was just, I'm going to, I'm interested in these things. I'm going to learn. So did, did that come like that drive and motivation to, to get the certification or was it all just a learning experience for you? I think that started when, when I got the feeling that I could do it. Yeah, right? I always had in my mind, okay, you know, I, it might be something that I will go for in, you know, 10 years or something. <clears throat> but when I got the feeling doing those mock exams uh, together with Tamim, I would say, when I got the feeling, hey, I might actually be able to pull this off. Yeah, then there was like a switch, right? Then you say, okay, I, now I just need to go for it. And yeah. that was basically... Uh, the period right before the the first board, up until yeah the the second one where I passed uh, the the second full one where I passed, yeah that was just one drive to okay now let's go for it right, uh, and then you then I also was able to ask some time off right I said hey you know give me three weeks just to prepare for this uh, for this board and you know I'll I'll go for it I'll fully. Uh, I'll fully um, take myself out of any project work of any other uh, work that I'm doing at the moment and focus on this uh, goal. And uh, I was also happy that my leadership uh, back then agreed with, with, <laughs> with that uh, ask of me. Uh, and then, yeah, it's the final stretch to go there. Uh, but yeah, that, that motivation really came uh, after I, I knew that I could do it. Yeah. Yeah, nice. And obviously, I, I, we see a lot of CTAs in the market giving back and helping others on their journey. And like you've just mentioned, like you've, you've given us a number of names of people that kind of helped in your journey. But what do you most enjoy now about being on the other side of the table and, and helping others um, achieving their goals of, of um, striving towards the CTA? Uh, I think first is sharing my knowledge. Um, that's, yeah, that's just fun to do, seeing others uh grasp whatever knowledge you have and become better architects because of it uh that really motivates me um i think another thing is that you s just see a lot of different points of view right not everybody has different experiences in their career and they bring other things to the table. Maybe they've worked with other technologies on the platform than, than I have. And, you know, we can learn from each other as well, right? Uh, I don't, a lot of people that I sit uh, in, a, in a mock as a judge, a lot of people are like, oh, that's the CTA, uh, you know, they know everything. But yeah, that's not the case, right? Um, we we know a lot, right? But maybe you have a different type of expertise uh, and that you can uh, bring to the table, and that yeah, the judges can learn also from. And what I what I especially enjoy sharing is uh, this expertise that I've built up around identity and access management, um, because there is actually not a lot of people inside of the Salesforce space that really enjoy that it's mm -hmm. more okay it's a necessary evil to pass the cta board or to apply to a project in in some rare cases but it doesn't happen very often and being able to share that knowledge and maybe a bit that uh, that that hunger for or hunger for knowledge around the topic uh, i see that it's appreciated by a lot of people uh, i even you know have a have a half an hour each week with somebody, uh, an aspiring CTA in Salesforce, uh, who specifically set up that half hour to know about these uh, identity and access topics. Um, but I also, I browse regularly the, uh, we have a Slack channel that 
is all about identity and access management, where people ask for help. And you know, I, I love trying to tackle different types of problems in that area in the in different uh, enterprise contexts. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. So if there's someone listening to this, uh, maybe that doesn't work at, at Salesforce, but um, you know, maybe wants to pick your brains on on um, any topics really, but identity and access maybe specifically, uh, where's yeah. the best place for them to reach out? I would say uh, first on on LinkedIn, but I'm also active on Twitter. Not super active, but uh, yeah, if you send me a DM there, then uh, I'll definitely uh, answer you. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the chat and uh, yeah, really great to hear your insight and your journey. And uh, I'm sure people will take a lot away from that. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for, uh, for doing this. No, my pleasure. Thank you.